Morning, church. Last week, we began our fall prayer series called Wireless and learned that the, the whole process over these three weeks is to give us a better understanding of the true nature of prayer, to help us make prayer a part of our daily lives so that we can make sure we don't lose our connection with God. Last week, we talked about the fact that there are all kinds of innovations in technology that have helped us in incredible ways. But sometimes that technology carries with it connectivity issues that disrupt or cause a weakness in our signal. We talked about the fact that we can also have connectivity issues in our prayer life and in our walk with God. We talked about the importance of connecting to God and that God has given us this gift of prayer so that we can have dialogue with him, that we can have conversations with him. But I've experienced that many people struggle to utilize this gift because they find that they either have this weak signal or they experience a lot of noise when they try to pray and when they try to talk to God. So to help us to eliminate some of that noise and interference, we talked over five troubleshooting tips that you can use to help restore and strengthen that connection with God. And we learned that troubleshooting tip number one is simply to confess your sin. Sin is one of the greatest disruptors in our connection with God because the very definition of sin is that which separates us from God. Unconfessed sin is this noise that just drowns out any possibility for us to hear the voice of God. And when we confess our sin, we get rid of that interference. We get rid of that noise. Troubleshooting tip number two is that we need to forgive. In Mark eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus says, Whenever you stand praying, forgive if you have anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven may also forgive you your trespasses. We need to ask ourselves, is there someone that I need to forgive? And then we pray, God, you have forgiven me, so I choose to forgive. Troubleshooting tip number three was care for the needy. We often get wrapped up in our own worlds that we don't see the needs of others that are unfolding right around us. And we learned that if we're too self-absorbed or we're not other-focused, God said that our prayers might as well fall on deaf ears. Troubleshooting tip number four was be still and listen. A lot of times we expect that God's going to speak to us in this magical kind of booming voice. But we see in scripture that God most often speaks to people in their silence. And we learn that Psalm 46, 10 says that we should be still and know that I am God. One of the simplest definitions there is to being still is being silent on the outside and surrendered on the inside. And we asked ourselves, what would it look like if we found space daily to just be quiet on the outside, to be still, to eliminate all of the noise? And then surrendered ourselves inwardly and said, God, use me. Let me be your vessel. Troubleshooting tip number five was simply become a Christian. Jesus said that he is the way to the Father. So it follows that if we're not, if we've not given our hearts, our lives over to Jesus Christ, it may be difficult for us to have a growing and a thriving prayer life. So today we're going to chat a little bit about how we actually talk to God, finding the right words to say when we go before God in prayer. But before I get to those words, there's an important thing that we need to recognize because what we say is dependent upon who we say it to. For most of us, the language that we use when we're talking changes depending on who it is that we're speaking with. For instance, when we're in a setting with our supervisors or someone who is in a position of authority or power over us, our language set is different than if we were talking to our children or a family member. When we call a customer support line, it's likely that we're pretty frustrated when we call or we get angry as the call goes on and we skim through all of those number prompts or the voice prompts until we're finally put on hold to speak to that live person. And the tone of voice that we use when we started the call grows worse and more frustrated as time goes on and it can happen very quickly. What we say is determined by who we say it to. And how we say something to someone else is also dependent upon our mood at the time. And the same could be said about our conversations with God. I mean, understanding who God is at the core is essential 
and a beginning point for what we're going to say and how we're going to say it. In the Bible, we have a lot of images of God, but there are two distinct images that I want to focus on today. And, and the first is this image of God as king. So if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to the Old Testament book of Isaiah chapter 6. And we looked at this passage, we kind of like took a bypass around it, but we talked a little bit about it a few months ago in our It Sermon series. And the Israelite king had died, and there was this earthquake in Israel. And then the, the new king was struck with leprosy, and his son has taken over the throne. There's like chaos and disorder, there's unrest, and there's tension. And Isaiah is wearisome. Because he sees what's going on in the country, he sees what his own people are doing, and he knows that this is not a good thing. And he's, he doesn't know who's going to intervene. So he pleads with God. And God had a plan for Isaiah that changed his life. We'll look at verses 1 through 8. Hear these words. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, and the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called. And the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. And the seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Whom will go for us? And I said, here am I. Send me. Isaiah sees God. And he's one of the for a few people in the Bible who actually see God and live to speak about it. And he describes this scene as filled with glory. Now, the Hebrew word for glory actually means weight. And one of the best ways to illustrate this is think about dropping a heavy object into a glass or some kind of pool of water. And when the heaviness of that weight hits the water, the water ripples out and separates to make room for the thing that has been dropped into it. The same thing could be said about the glory or the weight of God. You see, when God comes down, everything in Isaiah's life was reorganized. Everything was shifted. Everything was radically moved. And this is consistent with other instances when God descends on the earth. God descended on Mount Sinai. The earth moved and Moses' life was forever changed. He was never the same again. God descended on a crowd on the day of Pentecost. And the Holy Ghost filled the people who were there. And the whole house shook violently. And everyone who was there that day and experienced it, they were never the same. And the point is this, there's a seismic shift and difference between viewing God as a concept and viewing God as a living reality in our lives. When God is a concept, he's light. We shape him. God doesn't shape us. When God is a concept, our lives are not reorganized by God. God is actually worked into our equation. Our needs outweigh God's needs. And when God is at the periphery or God is kept at arm's length, it gives us room to justify whatever we want. And when God is a concept, we tend to demand things from God and express frustration when we don't get our way. It's like calling into that customer support line and getting more frustrated the longer we're on hold. God all of a sudden for us becomes this faceless voice on the other end of the line. Someone will never see. So it doesn't matter, and we don't worry too much about what we say or how we say it because we, we just don't care. We call when we have a problem we can't fix ourselves, and when we don't get the solution we seek, we threaten to disconnect our service. On the other end of the spectrum is seeing God as a present reality in our lives. And when God is seen in this way, 
God's will weighs heavy on us. It affects everything we do. Because our relationship with God becomes part of who we are. It shapes us. It changes us. So when we talk to God, who are we talking to? Because what we say is dependent upon who we're saying it to. Are we talking to God as a concept? Or are we talking to God as a reality? Do we tell God that we need him over here and over there? And if you could clean this thing up back here, that'd be great. Or are we inviting God into everything, saying, your will be done in my life? My advice is that instead of picking up the phone and dumping all of our problems at God's doorstep and saying, here it is, you clean it up. What if we entered our time with God and said nothing? Now, it's true that prayer is a conversation. And part of a conversation is talking, but part of a conversation is listening. What would it look like for you to start your day in silence and say nothing at all? So that you might have a chance to hear what God has to say to you at the start of your day. It's not that we can't share our troubles or our frustrations or our laments and our worries and concerns with God. But take a play from Isaiah. He is stricken with grief and dismay. He, he's encountered this awesome presence of God. And Isaiah was looking for the cheap fix. When he sees God, he's probably thinking, you know, God's come down. God's going to intervene. God's going to fix all of this. And instead, he realized that God had a special call for him, that God needed him to be the messenger, that God wanted him to be the person to carry forth God's message. When Isaiah got out of the bed that morning, I don't think he had any idea in his mind, and I don't think his calendar had plans on it, that he was going to be the voice of God to his people. But when he was in the presence of God, he listened. And when God called, he said, here am I, send me. When you pray, do you realize that you are in the awesome power and presence of God? Do you take pause to recognize how holy of a time this is, a gift made possible by Jesus Christ that we should have access to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? If we took that pause and really thought about it that way, we might find ourselves completely lost for words. How do we talk to someone so high and mighty? Maybe the best thing is to just say nothing at all. To recognize that we're in the presence of the divine and allow God and God's word to speak to us rather than telling God what we expect him to do for us or reading scripture and using it to justice, justify whatever position or vantage point we're bringing with us to the text. Instead of reading something and speaking our assumptions to the text, maybe we should let the text speak to us. It's not, I think, I read, therefore God, but rather God thought, God spoke, therefore I. Some people see God as this sadistic monster in the sky, the, the cause of tornadoes in the plains, the God who commands people to commit violent acts against humanity, the God who allowed and allows disaster, devastation, destruction, hunger, famine, drought, suffering, death, all kinds of evil that we can imagine. And they see God not as someone that you run to, but someone you run from. Friends, evil is a part of this world, and sin has caused humanity to suffer, and God did not choose sin. This was not God's plan for us. In essence, we've made this bed that we now lie in. God isn't the cause, but God is the presence and the calm and the peace in the midst of the storm. Feel the weight of his power and let him speak to you in the midst of the chaos. Be still and listen. 200 times, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and 156 times in the Gospel of John alone, Jesus uses a unique Aramaic word to refer to God. You know what it is? It's the word Abba. And this word doesn't even really mean Father, as it's often translated in our Bibles, but it's most accurately translated into Dad. An Old Testament scholar, Joachim Jeremiah, said this, quote, I have examined the prayer literature of ancient Judaism, and the result of this examination was that in no place in this immense literature is the invocation of Abba Father to be found. Abba was an everyday word, was a homely 
word. It was a family word. No Jew would have dared to address God in this manner. Yet Jesus did it always in his prayers, which are handed down to us. And in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus authorizes his disciples to repeat the word Abba after him. He gives them a share in his sonship. He empowers the disciples to speak with their heavenly father in such a familiar and trusting way. End quote. You see, above God's fireplace, there's this massive portrait. And if you look in real close, you might see yourself. Because God the king came down off of his throne and he pulled up a chair right next to you and he's seated next to you and he's got his arm around you and he's saying, what do you need? What's going on? It's okay to ask. Ask and it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened for you. As a kid, I remember going shopping with my parents and asking when we were at the store for this thing or that thing. And today I do the same thing with Nicole. She's in charge of our grocery shopping. And somehow the bill is always higher when I accompany her. <laughs> and the response I received as a kid is the same response I receive now. If you keep asking, the answer will definitely be no. But God's saying the exact opposite. He's saying, keep asking, it doesn't bother me. So the second piece of advice is to say everything. We are silent in the presence of God, but we also need to share with God the things that are on our hearts and on our minds, not so that we get what we want, but that our cares, our concerns, our worries, our inhibitions might be taken away from us so that we can be freed to do the work that God has called us to. Even when we come into the power and presence of God, a moment that is truly awe-inspiring, it's also just a wonderful thing that God wants us to sit with him and talk with him just like a child would talk to their parent. God is the king of kings, and yet he cherishes you and loves you so very much that he wants you to be comfortable and relaxed in his presence. Say nothing. Let God speak into your heart and then say everything and allow God to take your problems away. God has given us full access to prayer and even if we stop and listen, sometimes we struggle to find the words of our own. And Jesus tells us what to do in Matthew chapter 6 verses 7 through 15. He says, when you are praying, do not heap up empty phrases like the Gentiles do for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father in heaven knows what you need before you even ask him. Pray then in this way. Our Father in heaven, how would be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not bring us to the time of trial, but rescue us from the evil one. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. My friends, whether we pray this prayer exactly like it's read or as we pray the Lord's Prayer on Sunday morning, there are four parts to this prayer. And we can use these four parts and craft our own words and use them anytime we pray when it's our turn to talk. Number one is simply, Father, thank you. No matter whether you're on the mountaintop or if you're in the throes of the valley, God has provided each of us with abundant blessings. It's harder to see that when you're in the midst of despair and in one of those dark corners of life. But that's when it's especially important to remember where you have seen God in those moments of trial and tribulation because it's those moments that you can recount that gives you the assurance that God is with you in the present and that God goes with you into the future. Number two, Father, use me. When God asked Isaiah who would be his messenger, Isaiah said, here am I, send me. When we pray, instead of telling God what God can do for us, ask God what we might be able to do for his kingdom. Instead of trying to make God conform to your will, ask God to show you his will for your life. Number three, Father, forgive me. Last week, we talked about the importance of confessing sin to eradicate noise, but I can tell you, if we're struggling... 
You're going, I, I, I just don't know what it is that God wants from me. Perhaps we've allowed something to slip in and interfere or disrupt our call. If you know what it is, confess it. If you don't know what it is, ask God to show you. And when he does, ask for forgiveness and move on. Number four, Father, help me. If you put a baseball in my hand, it's worth about five bucks. If you put it in the hands of Clayton Kershaw, it's worth about 30 million. If you put a football in my hands, it might retail for 20 or 25 dollars, but if you give it to Aaron Rodgers, it's worth almost 22 million dollars. Put a stick in my hand, I might be able to swat away a bug or two. Put it in the hands of a faithful man like Moses, and he can part the Red Sea. Give me some wood and a few nails, and I can probably put together a birdhouse or a toolbox. Put them in the hands of Jesus, and he saves the entire world. Trust God with what you have. He's reaching out to you. He wants to help you. Give him what you can, and know that he might help you multiply your gift so that you might use it to make a difference, but he might give your gift to someone else who can do that much more with it. God is there to help you, and he's reaching out to you. Are you going to reach back and take his hand, or are you going to still choose to go it alone? So many people are afraid of finding the right words to pray. Or they're afraid they don't know the right words. Friends, it's like this password that we put on our phones or on our computers to keep other people from seeing the information that we have that's important to us. But God is not password protected. He is the king of kings. He stepped down from his throne so that we might have full access to him. Our heavenly parent, our guide, our mentor, our champion. In this life, listen to him. Let him speak into your heart and into your life. Say nothing and just be still and listen. And then say everything in order to be made free. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the access and for the audience we have with you. We know your ears are always open to us. And we pray that we too would open ourselves up to listening to what you have to say to us. Father, we say thank you for our blessings. We ask that you would use us to build your kingdom. We pray forgiveness for our sins. And ask that you would keep us from evil and strengthen us in our weaknesses. This we pray in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My friends, uh, please don't forget today and in and the next couple of days or your last chance uh, to get in your contributions to get me in a chicken suit next Sunday morning. Uh, we're right around just shy of $6,000 towards that $10,000 goal. I've got the suit on order. Uh, so, And make sure you join us as well a week from tomorrow night at the Eastgate Chick-fil-A uh, for a, an evening of what is sure to be fun and fellowship. Uh, invite your friends to come and join us as well. All of the proceeds will go back to our Pursue the Dream campaign, which... Uh, is doing some renovations around our campus. My friends, my prayer for you this week is that you will find a space that you can be silent on the outside. Eliminate the noise so that you might be surrendered to God on the inside. And may God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and be with you always. We'll see you next week. <laughs>